We're now recording. Welcome everyone. We are representing the Go Open National Network today, and we're going to be talking about how open educational resources can support digital equity in your state. We're really excited that there's uh, a lot of enthusiasm for this topic. If you'd like, you can introduce yourselves in the chat with your name, your affiliation, your state, province, or country. Really great to know who's here and uh, Wonderful to see so many of you. This is um, a Zoom meeting, so uh, we can see each other, but uh, you can remain uh, muted, please, and we'll have time for uh, questions and, and discussion at the end. I'll start uh, introductions. I'm Amy Evans Godwin. I'm with ISCME as Senior Advisor and ISCME is short for the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. We're a global nonprofit based in Northern California, founded in 2002 around uh, equitable uh, educational environments with the mission to make educational uh, and learning environments more open, participatory, and equitable. We bring together social science and information science and education and research. And we have been the developer since 2006 of OER Commons, a digital public library and collaboration environment for OER at all levels. And we have services for custom libraries and professional learning and training, <clears throat> curation of OER, and um, the study of uh, practice and policy in this space. So I'm really happy to be here. Reg? Thank you, Amy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Reg Lichty. I'm the co-founder of Foresight Law and Policy. Uh, we are a Washington, D.C.-based uh, law firm that uh, works with our partners on educational equity issues across the preschool to workforce spectrum. We're very uh, kind of proud to partner with uh, the Go Open initiative on uh, this exciting kind of work in thinking about digital equity and the opportunity to use OER to promote equity for many of our most vulnerable populations across the country. So uh, with that, I'll pass uh, the baton to Doug. Thanks, Reg. Good afternoon to everybody. A lot of familiar faces. Uh, I am Doug Casey with the Connecticut Commission for Educational Technology. We're the state's ed tech arm. Our members include people from uh, the K-12 higher education library community. So uh, we come from a perspective of looking at sort of broad uh, footprint of teaching and learning and crosses into the world of open education resources and digital equity writ large, as well as the federal program. So uh, Amy, thank you for hosting us today and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Here's our agenda, what we'll cover today. Uh, I'll give uh, an update on the network itself, where we are, uh, and then why of OER. There's six areas of benefit that we feel are important for people to know and have a way of advocating for OER and its connection to digital equity. We'll have an overview of the digital equity federal opportunity and then a special spotlight with Doug on Connecticut. We'll have time for Q&A and we'll close with um, a call to action and a way to contact. Go Open is a, a community-led national effort. It started in 2015 with the Department of Ed's Office of Educational Technology as a federal initiative to bring states and districts into, uh, into implementing OER and OER awareness 
with um, certain requirements and commitments. And it went for many years successfully. ISME joined in 2018 as the partner with the Department of Ed. And then just a year ago, January 2022, uh, when the department stepped away from a federal initiative, they were able to kindly pass the baton to ISME to start a community-led consensus-built organization. And we formed a steering committee to uh, advance this, to really still concentrate on knowledge sharing and awareness, but also to grow a more diverse leadership and membership model and to develop strategic actions like the one you'll hear about today. Our progress in the last year has been exciting. With the steering committee, we developed a participant survey and we heard last fall what the top priorities are. We, the participants in the survey wanted a centralized place to share and do knowledge sharing. And we have since launched the Go Open Hub on OER Commons as a place for members and alerts and working groups and resources to share. We are uh, looking at removing the barriers that may have been in place for states and districts and organizations to become official partners. And what uh, the membership looked for really is no barrier. Uh, individuals can now join simply by going to the hub and joining the member group and subscribing to the newsletter, that's it. Then you're part of the network. We uh, I wanna support professional learning opportunities and particularly through peer mentoring, how a community can continue to educate itself and develop its professionalism around OER in the K-12 space. And the, a webinar series this year is part of how we're doing that. And then we could take on policy actions like this digital equity work to really try to impact the K-12 ecosystem more widely. Now I may be uh, preaching to the converted, those that know what OER uh, is, but uh, we really like to start with getting on the same page around materials that are openly licensed or in the public domain for the classroom at, at all levels and go open concentrates in the K-12 space. But OER in general is built on the notion of equity that uh, materials are open because everyone deserves equal access to high quality materials and they should be available to everyone with no barriers due to financial circumstances, geographic location, learning disabilities, learning needs and other circumstances that open is really a tool of empowerment for educators broadly and using OER can support digital equity and inclusion. So this is what you'll hear today is really a rationale for taking back to your states and districts to advocate for OER. And we'll talk about uh, equity in general and then the other five areas of, of benefit. Number two is adaptability. It's really uh, unlike Traditional restricted proprietary materials, OER can easily be adapted. And thanks to the open licensing, the materials are flexible and educators can make them meet the needs of their particular students, the context of their classroom, their geographic location, the language, and uh, everything that they need to serve their community. Materials can be updated and made relevant over time. They're modular, they can be updated and changed on a case-by-case -case basis without the delay of waiting for a whole set of materials to be updated. And this flexibility is really important for ensuring personalization, especially for those with learning differences. And that connects to the benefit area number three, accessibility. We're really aligned with working uh, between OER and accessibility to make these connections. We work with the organization CAST and their AIM Center and those that are working on uh, accessibility nationally because with the flexibility of OER, inclusively designed digital materials can be made more readily accessible for learners with disabilities. 
And this aligns with the use of the universal design for learning principles and the UDL guidelines so that materials are perceivable, usable, understandable, and robust. And that has the acronym CORE for the widest range of learner variabilities. So these guidelines are concrete ways that materials can be uh, made more meaningful and more engaging regardless of uh, disabilities. And commercial materials uh, often pose a barrier in this area. Benefit number four is around engagement. And there's a whole host of benefits for both educators and learners with OER. Through OER, educators can more easily personalize material, as we said. And in the process, educators themselves are, have more ownership and more investment in curriculum. Educators can adapt materials so that they are culturally responsive and culturally sustaining, speak to the local context and reinforce community. And as a result, students can see themselves reflected in their learning and become more engaged. And there's a whole area of open educational practice known as open pedagogy that includes students being creators and contributors of materials themselves and collaborators with instructors. So this is really a, a great area for engagement. Benefit number five is professional learning. And it, it starts to look at the type of investment, even though OER themselves the materials are free, it does take investment. It's not a, a cost-free uh, in uh, implementation to bring OER to a particular state or district. Educators need support. And uh, with support, they become empowered as professionals to develop, adapt, curate materials. And because really teachers know their students and communities best and OER gives them the opportunity to use their professional judgment. So we really advocate for investing in staff letting uh, staff have the support to collaborate and be less isolated, not have to start from scratch all the time. And with this engagement, maybe more likely to stay in the workforce overall. And then lastly, the area of benefit is long-term savings and uh, sustainability around making well-developed robust sets of OER available. Uh, local policy, whether it's state or district, can look at reallocating funding from needing to buy proprietary materials every year to supporting the staff, investing in the infrastructure and research and evidence-based work that OER can provide uh, uh, some long-term savings implications. So these are the ways that we advocate for OER uh, and, and connect to digital equity. And I will pass it now to Reg to talk specifically about the digital equity opportunity. Thank you, Amy. Uh, as we, you know, before I dive into the specifics of the Digital Equity Act to lay the foundation for a discussion about the great work that Doug is doing in Connecticut. I uh, just want to kind of wrap up uh, kind of some of those big policy themes that Amy uh, struck upon as she was walking through each of the advantages. I think there is a huge opportunity in both federal and state and local policy as well around really leveraging the potential of open as a, as a game changer for digital equity. Um, you know, the open licensing uh, flexibility around the adaptation and customization strategies that Amy talked about have huge implications for students and teachers and administrators as well. And as we think about, especially kind of the student perspective, really, um, you know, the responsiveness to the unique learn learning uh, uh, situation of the learner, a hugely powerful kind of lever, uh, giving teachers agency around evaluating 
uh, the materials and improving them that they're using with their students. Uh, and then of course, at the leadership level, really just uh, leveraging this open mindset that comes with these uh, wonderful open tools and you know, just having an intentional strategy around this is really the, at the heart of what we wanna talk about today uh, and this opportunity created by um, the Digital Equity Act and the funding that Congress provided to implement it. So, so just turning to, to the act itself next, um, uh, you might recall that at the end of 2021, so November of 2021, Congress uh, passed a massive uh, bipartisan infrastructure law that not only invested in uh, you know, things that you think about on the transportation side and infrastructure, but also makes a multi-billion dollar investment in broadband. And the Congress wisely uh, recognize that if you're going to spend $40 billion on the mechanisms to connect our communities to high capacity broadband and connected devices, you really should, as a state, uh, have a plan for ensuring that those uh, technologies are being used for the social purposes like education, that, uh, that they can really uh, to deliver. And so as part of the infrastructure law, Congress approved something called the Digital Equity Act. It's a three uh, part uh, you know, strategy, one that is uh, beginning with uh, grants for every state, every territory for tribes that want to write digital equity plans that aim to ensure that um, you know, every corner, every community of our nation is able to take advantage of, of, the, of the opportunities created by digital learning and other, uh, you know, uh, uses, workforce and other uses of, of broadband. So there's a $60 million uh, investment that is providing formula grants for every state to write a digital equity plan. Those states that successfully complete those plans Later this year, we'll have uh, access to a $1.44 billion pot to support five-year implementation of those, of those plans. Um, there's a third competitive grant uh, that will also be available for digital equity, um, other innovative digital equity ideas that NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, will later open for, for competition. So this is really prompting uh, some exciting planning across uh, the country about how to really promote digital equity in a way that we have uh, historically not been able to achieve. Um, and for our purposes today, uh, as state uh, teams develop these plans. Uh, you know, we as a community of open advocates, as educator advocates, as student champions, have an opportunity to help those planning teams think about how open educational resources uh, can help every state achieve the Digital Equity Act's inclusivity and accessibility goals through open educational resources and um, we are um, you know excited to share it's been out for a few uh, uh, months now a uh, resource that is designed to help those teams writing these digital equity plans think about those opportunities for making OER part of that vision that is to say these plans should not just be about the nuts and bolts of broadband connections and about delivery of connected devices. Uh, the plan should really tell the broader story about how uh, every jurisdiction is thinking about ensuring that students, uh, veterans, uh, 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 all manner of, uh, of, of subgroups 
are able to take advantage of these technologies to really uh, learn and grow. Um, as a matter of just kind of practical insight for you, the governor of each state is tapping the lead uh, entity responsible for writing these plans. They have an obligation to consult with the education uh, uh, kind of leadership of the state and with other education stakeholders around the state. So there is already a clear opportunity for um, stakeholders to take their ideas, to champion open as part of this process. There's an open door to go along with the open vision. Um, every state will be obligated to publish these plans. Uh, so you can comment early before they're written, but they'll have to be published and they'll have to take comment on the plans themselves. So that'll be a, another clear, more formal opportunity to provide input into this uh, effort. And again, the Go Open team has uh, developed this resource and kind of see a picture of it on the screen and I'll hold up a copy as well that is available that prompts. And I think some really interesting ways, the entry points that you can highlight in your discussions with the state planning teams and includes everything from OER definitions that are widely accepted across the community to some policy ideas for really how to make the most of all of this. So we hope that after today's session, if you haven't had a chance to read this resource, that you'll take a look at it and you'll consider sharing it with uh, your peers around the states. So with that, I think transitioning to the next slide, uh, we're just thrilled to have Doug Casey here today uh, to give us a really hands-on look at how this uh, process is unfolding in the state of Connecticut and how OER fits into the Connecticut puzzle. So thanks, Doug, for being here. Thanks for the handoff, Reg. Uh, great, great uh, foundational background for uh, looking at really the, the sort of planning and implementation of these digital equity plans and how they they really draw on and, and depend on access to open resources. And that's part of the plan. Uh, before that, I want to give you a little bit of background on uh, our, our OER journey um, and, and kind of how it dovetails into the, the issue of digital equity. Um, just as, as quick background, um, our, uh, our Commission for Educational Technology is the lead for both OER in the state as well as the digital equity plan. So uh, there's, a, there's good intersection for us. Um, but quick backstory for us, we, we became a Go Open state back in 2017. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that's a statement and, and it's some assurances where the rubber really hit the road is when we developed uh, a uh, microsite uh, with ISCME. So underneath the hood of Go Open CT is, uh, is the OER Commons engine. And we've been thrilled with the, the results so far. Um, by design, we intended the state OER portal to serve both the K-12 community as well as higher education. Uh, we wanted this to be open, not, in, not only in terms of materials, but also in terms of participants. Um, one of the big pluses of having this K-12 and higher ed is at the secondary level, high school into community college and four-year universities, we see a lot of sharing of resources and collaboration in that space. Um, we have been working really closely with our state education agency. If it's not clear already, uh, the Commission for Educational Technology in Connecticut is not uh, part of the Department of Education. We have a, a, an appointed member who represents the state education agency. Uh, but we work really closely with uh, the state education agency and uh, they have been uh, statutorily mandated to develop statewide curriculum across all uh, all subjects. And so there is a growing library of materials in Go Open CT uh, that, uh, that is just that, the, the statewide uh, curriculum. So starting off with a Black and Latino studies course, uh, financial literacy, middle school math, uh, the list is starting to go on and on. 
uh, we just post it. They got to develop it. So uh, we're really thrilled that this has become not just a site for uh, for uh, educators and professors to come on and and develop and collaborate, but also sort of at a statewide level, the authoritative source for curriculum. Um, and we got. Uh, about, uh, by our estimates, about a third of our teachers and professors who are using the site. So we're really, really happy with those results. Um, I'm going to jump to the next slide, Amy. So shifting gears for, for a sec and talking a little bit about the digital equity plan. So as, as Reg said, this is part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And, uh, and part of this broader swath of broadband funding that's come through ARPA and IIJA. Uh, keep in mind that there are sister grants, uh, especially one called the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Grant um, that, uh, that are really more concerned with the sort of boxes and wires. Uh, and, um, and so the digital equity grant we talk, it talks about availability and adoption, but uh, there's a whole separate tranche of funding that is dedicated in each state to making sure that uh, there's uh, available broadband uh, uh, available, hopefully at every, every location, every household, that's the goal. Um, but it, as, a, as a quick background, you know, the definition of digital equity is on the screen here. Uh, this is highly derivative of the definition that can, comes from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, and it's a great, it's a great broad definition. Uh, to kind of ground what we mean by digital equity, we're talking about broadband devices, um, resources uh, in the form of content uh, or state services, other kinds of, of digital services. Uh, and then, you know, really importantly, we're talking about competencies, capabilities, and then technical support. Uh, at, at the beginning and end of this whole journey, uh, it's about making people's lives better by broadening educational opportunities, uh, telehealth, uh, uh, workforce development, uh, work from home, all the benefits that come along with being connected and skilled in, in the 21st century. That's what this whole grant is about. Uh, the who is really important as well. If you take a look at the the notice of funding opportunity, and uh, I'll, I'll drop the uh, the link in here. I happen to be a big fan of actually going to the source of legislation. Don't be scared; it's a long document, but go right page, to page 19 and scan through. Uh, you'll get a better sense of what this grant is all about. The focus is really on the under the who on this slide. Uh, these what are called covered populations, and as you kind of scan through these and you think about. What's the overlap between those covered populations and, uh, and, and the kids we're working to educate, as well as teachers? There, there's a lot of overlap here. So while the digital equity uh, uh, covered population list doesn't specifically call out uh, households with school-aged children, uh, there's a strong overlap here. Uh, and quite frankly, there's a strong overlap with high, the higher education community as well. Um, next slide, please, Amy. Um, so uh, just another sort of piece of background about what this whole digital equity plan is, is all about. Um, you know, as Reg said, there, there are three phases of it. There's the planning grant, there's the, uh, the capacity grant, and then there's a competitive grant. So every state right now is in the planning phase. So uh, there, there are not millions and millions of dollars that are going directly to digital navigation and other kinds of programs right now. Every state in the country and every state is participating is, is engaged right now in the development of a, a digital equity plan. And probably every state right now is working hard at gathering input from uh, community and state leaders and directly from residents. The key questions that we're asked to answer with the digital equity plan that are going to inform uh, going to inform that that deliverable, that plan in the fall that we're all going to be delivering is is what are the barriers to digital equity? Um, and those could be financial, they could be, you know, I can't get access in my household. 
Uh, there just isn't an option. Uh, there could be language barriers. Uh, there could be uh, just honestly one of the biggest uh, in having conversations. One of the biggest barriers to digital uh, digital adoption is just understanding the value of it and people, um, you know, people taking the steps to get online. Um, we're also charged with uh, with looking at what assets are in place already in each state. So, what is an asset? Uh, it could be a training program at your local library. It could be uh, the National Affordable Connectivity Program and the progress that your state has made in getting people signed up to broadband service through that program. Uh, so looking at an asset map, uh, and then also really key is looking at alignment with other state plans. And this is, I think, where we start to see some really strong synergies between the OER uh, a charge and mission and digital equity, which is if you look at the alignment with other state plans, you can see education is a specific call out here. And the notice of funding opportunity does uh, ask state uh, states who are de developing digital equity plans to engage with uh, schools, higher education, uh, specifically uh, uh, community colleges as well. So um, you see a lot of crossover here. Uh, a link to our uh, uh, our digital equity web pages there, and, and also uh, for you all uh, who are per perhaps wondering who in my state is leading this digital equity plan, you can find out by visiting the second link on that page, uh, the Internet for All, that's the White House's uh, page on all these broadband programs, uh, but the, the interactive map link uh, will allow you to, to uh, jostle around a couple pull-down menus and, and find out who in your state is working on the digital equity plan so you can go and be in their business and make your presence known that you care about education and, and open education resources. Uh, so with that, I'm going to take uh, a pause and uh, I think we're going to have uh, maybe a little bit of discussion. Yeah, Doug, and while uh, you know our listeners are thinking about questions for you, and I hope uh, you'll drop those into the chat or just share them directly, I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, you know, the Digital Equity Act itself and the NTIA's materials to states really call on um, the planners in every jurisdiction to think about how this interacts with um, you know, states workforce goals, uh, educational outcomes and goals, and you alluded a couple of times to sort of the uh, both the, the secondary and post-secondary uh, kind of vision in Connecticut and, and, and the work, I think maybe that if I'm hearing correctly is underway in Connecticut around ensuring both that kids are ready for success in college, but also kind of the remediation component. Can you just drill down a little bit more around kind of the, the open advantages, particularly I think for your post-secondary institutions trying to remediate students who are maybe not yet ready for college level curriculum? Yeah, it's amazing how our institutions of higher education and K-12 schools can often be just living in different worlds. Um, being with a, an organization that serves both, I, I find very different cultures and sometimes there are some artificial barriers there. But the good news with OER is in having conversations with, um, with, with leaders in, in colleges and schools and, and talking with professors, uh, and, and teachers, we found some great examples of sort of opportunity and collaboration. So one good example is uh, a lot of our community college professors find that they're teaching, um, you know, remedial classes, as you said, like the equivalent of an algebra two uh, to students. And what they're in search of are high quality standards aligned materials, courses that will help them to uh, to, to really sort of tuck right in and meet students where their uh, where their learning level is, uh, the mastery that they've accomplished. So um, I think that's a that's a great opportunity there in terms of uh, you know this sort of cut off at grade uh, at grade twelve and start in college in, in some ways is artificial. 
And, and so this starts to break down some of those barriers to learning materials so that uh, folks in, in higher education have access to, uh, to high school rigor. And then conversely, as we all know, there are students who are really ready for college college level courses. Uh, they take AP courses, et cetera, but um, there are many high schools and some middle schools even that are looking for advanced college level uh, course materials, whether it's uh, textbooks or uh, full courses. And so allowing them access into that world of higher education materials is also quite powerful. Um, so I think those are a couple, a couple of examples how we're, we're trying to use this platform to break down those barriers between uh, the two different worlds of, of secondary and, and higher education. So I, I think, you know, not without, not without uh, being able to know, right, all of the planning committees across the country that there might be sort of a kind of heavy lean towards uh, professionals that are uh, expert in the connections themselves. That is right, the nuts and bolts of, of, of ensuring that broadband access is, is uh, you know, available not only for anchor institutions, but into the home and other kind of places where people might interact with it. Doug, you have advice as someone from the education perspective that's deeply part of the planning process about how uh, best to communicate about OER and the educational advantages of this digital equity work, kind of putting you on the spot with this one, but just putting yourself in the shoes of some of your peers who are not educators, do you have ideas to, to suggest that we might uh, take, take to those folks? Uh, yeah, and I think I think sort of piggybacking on this theme of different cultures in higher ed and secondary uh, or K-12, there are different concerns in terms of equity in those two worlds. Uh, if you talk about cost savings, for example, and the benefits that OER uh, affords in that in, in that arena, if you're talking to a school board, uh, they're excited about the potential to use open education resources because you're able to, uh, to, to shift the cost of materials, for example, uh, into an investment in staff and developing high quality shared uh, and highly, highly uh, dynamic course materials and, and learning materials uh, so that year over year you're saving money in materials costs or even uh, doing some fun stuff like collaborating across school districts to create shared materials, or, or as as I shared earlier, uh, state level curriculum materials. But when you're talking with folks in higher education, the focus tends to be about the the cost of education to individual students. And uh, if you if you are thinking about the cost of textbooks for students, uh, we know from studies that a lot of students decide. Uh, what courses to take based on whether they can afford the textbooks, even which majors to take. Uh, there are a lot of students, unfortunately, who have decided not to pursue STEM careers uh, because they just couldn't afford a $300 calculus or a biology textbook. If we start to shift that, cost shift that over and start to use open source materials, now you've removed that factor from decision making and you're able to allow students uh, a, to take the courses they want, pursue the majors they want, and hopefully uh, end up with degrees that will move them forward in their career choices. So, um, you know, one big thing about OER is, you know, there are so many benefits, and Amy did a great job of articulating this early on. Who you talk to, it almost becomes a Swiss Army knife of what are you going to talk to it depends on who you're talking to. So, um, you know, there are, there are uh, lots and lots of benefits and, and uh, depending on the conversation and the need, uh, you can speak to many of them. In the chat, uh, Dan is asking if uh, we're aware of any examples of school boards that have adopted OER. I know in our state we we have um, there have been some concerted efforts in various school districts, and in fact, we talk about uh, talked about Connecticut becoming a go open state. 
um, that there you can become a go open district and there are materials uh, sort of a, 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 a guidebook on how to do that but uh, but yes there are districts that have adopted OER and doing that can take many different forms you can start off small by saying we're gonna we're gonna ship these three courses and then measure the the materials cost over time uh, to, to look at those year-over-year -year cost savings. So the short answer is, yeah, uh, many districts are, are starting to go in this direction, and, um, and we're trying to help them along the way. Uh, the same thing with, uh, with, with colleges, usually course by course at the college level, because there's a lot more focus on academic freedom, and you don't tell professors what to do, uh, but they are, they are opting in and choosing open resources, creating their own or curating their own. I saw the question too from Christine about uh, research about textbook costs. Uh, I don't have them at my fingertips, but I do have some uh, that I could lend. And you know, Amy, I'm, I'll, I'll bet you Ismi has some research in that area too, because you're the gurus in this area. We will look for that. Uh, thanks for that question. I haven't seen specifically on choice of major, but there's a, a lot of research that uh, does impact uh, course choices and you know whether a student successfully completes the course we have a you know significant uh, evidence that students avoid buying the, the textbook and don't complete the course and don't often finish their um, their community college work uh, or at, at any level where the financial barrier is significant and, and I can't provide a link right now, but I give you a quick story. Uh, the the state senator that represents uh, the University of Connecticut, where the University of Connecticut is, uh, got together with a bunch of students from the University of Connecticut, drafted and passed legislation that required uh, an OER pilot, and that has been going on for several years. Uh, with a year-over-year -year conservative cost to students of a million dollars uh, each year for textbook savings, and that's only a course or two. So, um, you know, uh, keep this in mind as you're 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 right in the middle of probably your legislative sessions, or at least we are. Maybe a bit late for new proposals, but uh, but talk to your state legislators as well. Uh, legislation is a great way to encourage the use of open education resources and raise awareness of it. Thanks to Marissa for putting a report from PERG and uh, Spark also often has uh, research on this. And what we've seen is that STEM areas have the most expensive textbooks and materials. So that may be influencing student choice. And uh, just on this subject, uh, in Connecticut, I remember us talking about this, Doug, before that a lot of the broadband and technology uh, issues in Connecticut is not about coverage. It's not necessarily about access, but it's a, it's a human issue around adoption. And we want OER to be, you know, one more good reason to to be using the technology. It's their uh, certain you know messaging that you're putting out to a, to the broader community uh, that includes open open access yeah and to touch on that really quickly amy we're, we are um we knew that we were already pretty broadband rich here um it's probably not a big thing to brag about because we're a relatively small state with relatively uh homogenous terrain we're not like some of our plain states where you know uh those states that are that are uh straddling the continental divide and whatnot um but we've done a pretty good job of getting people connected um, and then that was confirmed. Our, our governor Lamont passed legislation last year that funded and required cable carriers to provide us with their uh, with their uh, customer data uh, down to the track level. So we know with pretty pretty strong confidence that uh, and through the map link that I, I dropped in the chat, we know where availability is, and it's in about 99% of our households, uh, you can get broadband, and we know what adoption looks like. That story is not quite as rosy. We only have about three quarters of our residents who are taking advantage of broadband. So we know 
that availability is not the primary barrier. That's kind of an obvious thing. If you can't, you know, if there's no one offering the service, you can't get online. But that's not the case in our states. We're really trying to focus in on what are those behavioral issues uh, or, or financial issues that may be getting in the way of people uh, adopting broadband. So that's kind of what we're focusing on. Them. And if it's if it's a value to share, I always try to mention this is, you know, even when you get nearly universal access, that is that is really only one important step along the journey, getting people to understand the value of being online and the benefits to that. Uh, that's a whole nother sort of set of storytelling, outreach, and, and advocacy. What do you think um, state digital equity planners like yourself and other colleagues uh, might need to know or want to hear from educators on the ground that are interested in OER or where some of this is, you know, playing out in their classroom. Is that uh, messages that could help with the planning uh, process? Absolutely, yes. And, and the question becomes in, in, in how many different ways I think qualitative and quantitative can really help. So, um, you know, I, I look at some states already collect digital equity data. So there may be at the state level or at the local level, you already may be able to reach out to local school districts and, and get some pretty good data on which students have access, which students by virtue of looking at activity logs are, are, are logging on at home. Uh, obviously, if there's a student in a household, you're also mapping activity within the household in terms of broadband activity and availability. Uh, but there's also some really great qualitative feedback that you can get. I mean, when you talk to a technology director in a school district uh, or the director of teaching and learning, uh, uh, or individual teachers, you get a better sense of, um, uh, of of what the lives of students are like, what those barriers may be, um, the other kinds of, of dynamics that may be in play. The, the, the thing that I would want to emphasize too is uh, there's been a focus on broadband. I think that's really important, but I think we need to be thinking about um, student-centered solutions, uh, family-centered solutions. So it's not just having broadband at home, that's really important, but it's also thinking about um, what are the mobility needs of students? How does connectivity, how do the, the, the availability of high quality uh, materials follow students? Um, are we equipping them with the devices that are adequate for their learning needs? Um, it's, these are not simple questions with simple answers, but I think that's where you can start to get at some of the um, some of the responses from school leaders that will help to much more nuanced and long term more effective digital equity plans. Well, Go Open is uh, one national network, and I know you're uh, working with CETA, uh, bringing national ed tech leaders together. Uh, what ways are you? anticipating that states might be able to learn from each other as they're doing this planning? Uh, that's a great question. And it's one that we've, we've asked the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, like, what, what are you planning to do to aggregate all this material? Um, first of all, please know that, uh, that there are a number of different affinity groups and meetings that are happening almost on a daily basis among digital equity leads for states. So we're already sharing best practices. We're sharing our woes, such as the misleading uh, 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 fabric of the FCC maps that are being uh, chatted about uh, in, in this meeting. Uh, that's a whole other topic. So there are some really great shared resources. I think um, one thing that we're we're all about in Connecticut is we are partnering with the uh, with research institutions, uh, specifically spinning up a digital equity collaborative through the University of Connecticut. What we want to do is encourage long term study into this area um, and, and how it crosses over with other kinds of inequities like housing, food, uh, health equities, because these are not separate issues. They are all braided, unfortunately, together. So. Our goal is to produce some research that we can share with the rest of the world and hopefully it benefits other states. 
uh, and vice versa. Uh, this should not be 50 separate activities that get funded and then go away. What we're really hoping for is a really great national discussion and, and shared resources around um, you know, closing, closing the digital divide. And uh, the last thing I'll say with this, you know, we bring it back to OER, uh, that is the long-term goal with the OER movement too, as we move even from a, uh, you know, the under the hood with OER Commons is moving toward this shared framework where we can look at more easily sharing materials across state lines, et cetera. So many states, so many universities have shared educational outcomes and standards we're all developing materials in parallel. Uh, we need to be working more in concert with each other and making sure that those materials are available across state lines as well. That's great. Uh, I will go to the slide, but please keep uh, any questions you wanna ask uh, in the chat, keep it coming. Uh, you can engage with the Go Open national work uh, at this link. You can download the, both the letter to digital equity planners and the guidance at OER Commons on the hub or just uh, search it in the library, you'll find it. And uh, join us, join us in these conversations. Uh, there's just so many uh, of you that are already OER implementers. Uh, we, we might also be talking to, to digital planners but often those champions are not talking to each other. There's still this divide between the, the boxes and wires, as you're calling it, Doug, and the curriculum instruction. And we wanna build some, some bridges between those two worlds. Someone shared Casey Merchant. The Institute for Self-Reliance is a good source to follow around broadband equity. Thank you for that. And Reg on COSIN. Connectivity speed at home during COVID closures recommending much faster speeds. Yeah. I did want to comment on the the mapping thread. It is it is interesting. There's a this may seem like minutia, but it's very difficult to gauge availability if you don't know where your houses are. Uh, in 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 our state, we were looking at the FCC's proposed base layer, like where people live, and um, we had uh, we had. Uh, Oh gosh, all kinds of things that that were presented as houses, like uh, old storage sheds and marshes, and so we we actually had to go in and sort of start from scratch and start with our nine one one layer. Um, I'm sharing this because as you think about connecting everybody in your state, the steps that lie in in front of that are finding out where every residence is in the state, and I think that is going to take a, a good amount of time and funding is slightly dependent on that. Uh, so uh, as you think about the boxes and wires side of it, uh, that's part of what's going on now. Uh, there, this is not an easy task. It's important work, but it's probably gonna take years uh, before we really get down to sort of a, a common understanding of where availability is and where it isn't. Well, our network call for action and uh, Doug and Reg and myself are on the steering committee for the network is that we really want the K-12 community to join us and diversify engagement with OER that it doesn't remain just well-resourced uh, districts or uh, states that have included K-12 in their policy, policy allocation. K-12 is still lagging behind uh, higher ed in the amount of uh, formal uh, allocate funding allocations and structures that higher ed has really been taking the lead on. Uh, we're asking people if you wanna join uh, working groups or create a working group of people that are motivated to reach uh, their goals for open curriculum and open practice, we wanna support that. 
and uh, really reach out and speak to your digital planning team about equity and inclusion. So uh, I will also put our contact information and also our um, general information info at goopen.us and our wonderful community management lead Becky Henderson is on the call too. She's managing also our LinkedIn presence is a new social media um, activity for us to have more meaningful conversations. We're still on Twitter, but we wanna have discussions here with professionals and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, send us newsletter items or any alerts that things that you wanna share on the hub and we can really start to build awareness nationally for K-12 OER. Really so great to have you all here today. Thanks for pulling this together, Amy. Thank you. We I'm getting some questions about sharing stuff and we will follow up with uh, a thank you and a link to the recording and, and link to the slides, which are publicly available and uh, all the other things we've shared today. So thank you so much. Thanks everybody.